put off by how long this video is. Don't worry, I try to jam pack my videos with as much content and as much detail as I possibly can. Anything I feel I can comment on and that I feel you might be interested in, I pretty much put in the video. I try not to repeat myself and talk fairly fast. If the video is too long for you, I have recorded a shorter version and the link will be in the description box. Alias Series Review LA. Seven years ago, Sydney Bristow was approached in college studying English lit literature. You know, studying to, you know, she want, wanted to become a teacher. She was approached by someone working for the CIA and she, you know, she was to keep this a secret from everyone, but when her boyfriend proposed to her, she couldn't help but open up to him and tell him that she's a spy and that, you know, that got him killed. She then accomplishes something to prove that she's trustworthy and, you know, now that she knows that she's been working for the very enemy she tried, she thought she was fighting. SD6, which she thought was a CIA Black Ops Division, is actually an international criminal organization. What's that thing about the fury of a woman scorned? She now becomes a double agent for the CIA, you know, giving them any information she learns working at SC6 and doing counter missions, sabotaging their objectives, you know, they giving them fakes and the CIA the real, you know, items. And, you know, both of these types of missions may suddenly change or not go as planned. Maybe, you know, someone is recognized. Maybe an assassination attempt happens much sooner than anticipated. And this, you know, this gets very tense. They, they intercut it with briefings and, you know, spare time, time spent at college and the like you know, keeping it interesting. And, you know, they deal with gun runners, terrorist organizations, enemy spies and spy organizations, former spies. It, there gets to be a theme of doing something, you know, helping a an evil spy agency in order to, you know, gain their trust and whether or not you can even trust someone, anyone, in a world of double agents, and trust will be tested, betrayed, have to be rebuilt. Sometimes they'll have to do something extreme to prove, you know, that they're on someone's side, and it brings in, you know, moral grays, lesser evils. Characters routinely extort and gain leverage on others, and go against their principles. There are a lot of, you know, other spy organizations, and early on it can be difficult to keep track of. The rules are broken, and they've intentionally steered clear of any ripped-from-the-headline stories. With... With the spy world, there's, of course, you know, there are secrets upon secrets, and, you know, any reveal of such will have to be dealt with, and often the only way to deal with them is emotionally. There are a lot of mysteries, tons of plot twists, and, you know, some of them don't really go anywhere, but they do just about all fit with the spy world and this is the most complex and smart spy fiction that I've seen in any medium. You know, they... There are a number of... 
different elements that you have to pay close attention in order to fully keep track of everything that's happening. This has, you know, a lot of aged and former spies, you know, with middle-aged cast, including guest cast, and this is treated as more, you know, as something to respect. It's treated with respect, and, you know, they are just more experienced. They, you know, they're still incredibly, you know, still, they are incredibly competent agents, and they, you know, they look great. The, you know, some of them even look sexy, the, the ones that are meant to. And, you know, it's really that they, they started, you know, when they were young. So, yeah, they have decades of experience. And some of these operatives are so skilled that they can actually operate in a situation where you think that they couldn't possibly, you know, they, they blink code. They, you know, just, yeah, it's, it's pretty insane. And there's, you know, they, they plan for things that you couldn't, we, yeah, you, you couldn't, it, you know, it seems like it would be impossible to plan for all of this. There are no Mary Sue's or Gary Stu's on the show. Nobody is always perfect, and every single character that, you know, yeah, even most of the, the guest ones, you know, if, if you have a character, if you're more than an extra, they, you know, they have some kind of emotional, you know, yeah, you know, it's, it's some, there's, there's something there they have to deal with emotionally. You know, none of them are just pure carbon, you know, pure black and white bad guys. Again, pretty much, you know, if there, if there is a character, they, yeah. You know, especially the most major. Not unlike Dexter, sometimes they're almost seen, but it works out, you know, for some reason, and that can lessen the impact and get annoying. This really goes into the psychology of a spy. There's a lot to compartmentalize. You know, there are, yeah, there are just a lot of things that cannot be you know, they can't show how they feel in the given situation when they actually feel it. At times, it does get to be like porn. It's, you know, there's just too many, too big, you know, events, too, too you know, too emotional, too just, yeah. And, you know, the, the good guys tend to really have a heart, really care about the, the people that, you know, might get hurt or such. You know, among the inspirations are codenamed Nikita and James Bond, right down to Cold War, you know, former Cold War in this case, of course, you know, operatives. And the first season and a half, you see the end of a mission at the, you know, as the first thing in the episode, although in, you know, here in the first season and a half, season and a half, it tends to be that, you know, the, the episode before it left on, left it on a cliffhanger. They, they were worried that the show might get canceled, basically, and yeah, some of these cliffhangers are really easily resolved, and that gets annoying. And, you know, a lot of the show is about, you know, Milo Rambaldi, a, you know, basically a mix of Leonardo, Da Vinci, not DiCaprio, and Nostradamus, who, you know, created a number of artifacts that, you know, it's this science fiction kind of thing. He predicted a ton of things and created things that weren't fully appreciated back then, and even today are amazing, you know, and these are stunningly designed. They, they look absolutely amazing. One of them, you know, is, is so memorable in its design. It's, it's basically a box that, you know, a, a season, if, if you buy the entire show, 
you can choose to buy it, you know, in a box that looks just like that. So, yeah. And the, you know, these machines or messages and the like, you know, will have to be activated. They're, you know, they hold information. Maybe the, maybe there's a machine that has to be, you know, put together or activated, something decoded. And it's, it is this religious faith, basically. And, you know, Sydney points out early on that it's, you know, she, as she puts it, everyone in the spy world is on a Ramboldi scavenger hunt. It's, yeah. Basically, the good guys want to keep them out of the hands of the bad guys. The bad guys want to do really bad stuff with it. And given that it is really powerful, yeah, it's, you know, even, you know, people who don't believe that Ramboldi was anything special, was more than just a really capable engineer, they have to take it seriously because they, you know, clearly these things, yeah, can, can be dangerous in the hands of the wrong people or the wrong hands of the people who grab those hands. The continuity is hard and you, you know, in spite of like previously on, you have to watch in close, you know, yeah, watch watch every episode close to the next and pay very close attention. There is no filler episode nor a single bad episode, though there are filler plots. The show tends to point out and poke fun at its own plot holes and contrivances. And, you know, the, the plot is great and the, the, you know, there's a lot of depth to, you know, plots, characterizations, dialogue is really well written. This has some strengths that Lost didn't, among others, it's much more straightforward. Basically, anything that happens is connected in some way to Sydney and or Ramboldi, where, you know, rather than it just has to be connected to the island and it can be at any point in time. And, you know, in this, it can be anywhere in the world, but usually that's because our guys went there. So it's not... Yeah, it's it's much easier to keep track and the show never completely loses sight of what is what it's about and what's going on. And never quite goes so deep in deep down the rabbit hole of you know high concept science fiction. And you know, calling it alias is not overselling it. In every single of the 105 episodes, there is at least one alias. You know, I'm in in what's it called? Maybe not in every single episode, but there are way more than 105 aliases. You know, there there are times where our entire team will be using aliases in an episode, sometimes more than one alias in an episode. And yeah, there are episodes where Sydney uses a handful of aliases. And the, you know, there, there will be subtle things to the acting to, that fit the, the alias, you know, the, the, the clothing is memorable and there are a few of these where it's like culturally offensive. I think that it's just they're, they they didn't really know any better and it's, you know, I, I sincerely doubt that they meant to, you know, offend. And the, you know, yeah, we, we get more than, you know, far more than 105 cool spy situations and, you know, they, they have to get 
inside in and back out they you know they maybe retrieve intel and or technology there the you know the clothes Sid wears may be very revealing and flattering and it's you know it's an in an exotic location in you know maybe someone speaks a you know often Sydney speaks a real language meaning they actually had to learn it and you know they'll be using cool gadgets they go through a lot of clubs and just you know rich establishments during like parties and social gatherings and you know there are times where you don't see them escape if you can figure out how they did anyway and you know among the escapes you see are rappelling down from a tall building face first and you know parachuting from a mountain and yeah and getting past security you know maybe they have to get a code somehow maybe there's a gadget to bypass it maybe they have to get you know a maybe they they just need a a certain person's hand you know a palm reader and maybe that means you know taking that guy as a hostage and you know the dealing with guards you know may involve fighting them maybe using guns on them you know maybe it is just sneaking past them the pilot is solid and really sets up a lot of things for the show that are pretty much all followed up on and you know the the finale you know wraps up and gives closure to most of the overall storylines you know exposition you know there can be real exposition dumps in the briefings but then there are also a lot of visual storytelling of both gadgets and missions where you see what is going on you see you know suddenly you recognize someone's face or recognize an item you know a lot of gadgets yeah you just you see them use it and then you figure out what it's for and how it works and that kind of thing not everything is explained a number of the aging spies and such have a lot of back you know backstory that you know we aren't told but they just they have a lot of history the you know I've I've watched the show twice all the way through rewatched some episodes and I've played the game I have not read any of the novels this you know as far as JJ's you know stuff I've watched this lost and Mission Impossible 3 and you know, I don't know if you necessarily want to count it, but Cloverfield. I greatly recommend getting the DVDs. The you know there are a lot of you know featurettes. The the gang girls are great and great commentary tracks. You know there'll be funny informational you know funny and or informational. And this review is co-written by my ex-fiancee. Our protagonist is Sydney Bristow. She, you know, the the moment that you hear that it's it's a female spy or, or a woman within, you know, espionage. The, you know, what you what you maybe think is that she. She basically gets information by getting close to the, you know, getting through pillow talk. Yeah, getting getting close to the the people that they need information from, and you know, having sex with them. Thus, you know, yeah, getting the information. And here, the great thing is that Sydney basically never has to go all the way to having sex with them she 
she is so good at it. Her her sex appeal is so strong that she doesn't even have to have sex. You know, she can get the information, get close enough to them without having. You know, she'll she'll often dress very provocatively, but she'll never actually have sex with them. And her, you know. Her sexuality is far from her only or main asset. She's also an expert melee fighter, great at improvising in the melee fights, and a thoroughly capable field agent. The improvising does sometimes make it look like she goes into situations without any real plan and just relies on luck, you know, just convenient writing. And you know, basically, some people claim that Jennifer Garner cannot act. I completely disagree. Her acting does tend to fall into one of two categories. Real-life Jennifer Garner and then Badass Spy. And obviously, she spends most of this in Badass Spy mode. But she does also get to be sweet. You know, sometimes she uses that to fool, you know, People, you know, sometimes that is the, the the way to get information or get out of the situation. But it's also just we do see her in, you know, real real life outside of the spy world and this. And sometimes we see her in a very natural look. You know, she goes out for a jog and the the show very much, you know. It, it does highlight that women can be beautiful without, you know, wearing a ton of makeup, without necessarily, like, you know, making a huge deal of what they look like or what they're wearing or such. And it's very much a show that empowers young women. You know, you can, you can be a very capable person as a woman without it costing your femininity or personality you know it does some you know lead to sydney sometimes getting her away even when you know that doesn't yeah when when she in real life wouldn't at all but yeah with with it being that you know she is sexy sexy and gets sexual but you know always on her own terms and it's completely in her own control much like in Star Trek's Deep Space Nine and Voyager when she is being interrogated she will you know reply with snark and that's you know quite fun and in general she can be very immature you know she's emotionally mature but she yeah, you know, when it when it's not going to ruin a situation, she can be very immature and it's it's quite fun. The the show does sometimes get sappy with her emotional stuff. If you do not think that Jennifer Garner is adorable and dorkable, I you know, you and I just do not define those terms in the same way and I'm aware that there are people who say that, you know, oh, you know, she she looks like a horse. She's too masculine to be attractive, which ironically makes them as figuratively ugly as they are trying to say she literally is. Vaughn who is Bill Vaughn's kid, yeah, Bill Vaughn's his father, is, you know, a young spy. He's somewhat closed off and shy. And he, you know, the actor is French. And thus, you know, whenever they don't forget to, he will, you know, speak in French with, like, yeah, for, on, on aliases and the like. He works for the CIA, and he is Sydney's handler. And, you know, he can really be the the rock for Sydney. 
I feel really bad for Michael Vartan, the actor, having such a thankless job because this is the Sydney Bristow show. The the men are never as capable as the women, but most of the other men do get to be capable. And yeah, I mean, Vaughn almost never does. You know, early on, he doesn't get to be capable at all. And honestly, whenever, whenever a storyline involving him is at all engaging, it's because of the other characters involved, never because of him. And frankly, for all that he adds as far as dramatic storylines, he could basically be replaced with like a cell phone in Sydney's pocket that has like a database for, you know, the exposition that he feeds her. Granted, there are worse ones out there, Vince Chief among them, but it's too bad when fiction feels that in order to empower women, it has to be at the cost of men. And with that said, this very much is, you know, commendable for its feminist messaging. And, you know, sadly, this in this it does not quite reach the heights of Star Trek's Deep Space Nine and Voyager. Vaughn will get to do cool action. And where every main spy, major spy, has like a face of determination where you can still tell there's you know, there's pain behind it. There's something that they had to, you know, go through. Something that they have to suppress because they can't show it right now. His is probably the least impressive, the most weak looking. It reminds me a lot of Ben Affleck's Jack Ryan, which is not a good thing. He is pretty much the only person that Sydney can talk very openly with because he knows about her double life and her double agent status and, well, he's not her father. She, you know, he does have a girlfriend early on, but, you know, maybe the two will develop a romantic relationship, which means we have to sit through a lot of will they, won't they? And there is at least one love triangle, which I will argue is interesting. And there are times where Sydney is like a schoolgirl with a crush on him. That brings us to Jack Bristow, who is played by Victor Garber. He is Sydney's father and a truly amazing spy, which you know, is part of why she is so capable, you know, both the, his DNA and him raising her, although he only, you know, she only recently learned that he's a spy. And he is one of the only other double agents at SD6. He will sometimes torture for information among the, you know, moral greys. And yeah, he is very intense, very intimidating. Sydney and he have a strained relationship, but since her mother is dead, they are the only family that, you know, they only have each other. He's very protective of her, fiercely so, but he does also know that she's very strong. And, you know, they, they do have to actually work together in spite of this. At the core, this show is about real people and their relationships and, you know, the, the one the most at the forefront is the one between this young woman and her father. He routinely wipes the floor with Vaughn and his aliases can look kind of goofy, especially when they involve facial hair. Our 
Marvin Sloan, as played by Ron Rifkin, is the boss at SD6, and he has been lying to Sydney's face for years, and he's still lying to the you know right to their face uh, with everyone else on the you know yeah all the other big agents that don't know and you know for now she has to keep up appearances and unfortunately she is still close friends with his wife and until recently a friend of his as well and he doesn't even really treat her badly he's very kind to her in you know to whatever extent he he can in fact he claims to love her as his own daughter which from you know never stops being creepy he is absolutely terrifying there's there's a very clear distinct difference between Jack being intimidating and Sloane being terrifying and yeah it's it's completely clear which of them you know at the end of the day has a heart and which of them is you know just yeah willing to do the most awful things to yeah in order to accomplish awful things and he is extremely manipulative he is one of the show's numerous sadistic villains who will poke at their enemy with personal pain especially when it's a shared past of theirs and he is absolutely obsessed with Ramboldi and his aliases very often look silly Marcus Dixon, as played by Carl Lumley, is Sidney's partner and friend, and he he works for SD6 and still thinks they're CIA. He's a family man and very moral. Jen compares, I'm not certain if it's the actor, the character, or both, to Aslan, and from what little I know, that is quite appropriate. He's the moral compass of the show and the character and actor are like terribly underused. Marshall Flinkman, as played by Kevin Wiseman, is the lovable, awkward, dorky Q of the show. He builds and briefs on the innumerable gadgets. He's very excitable and he loves his work. He's clearly more comfortable working on and explaining gadgets than yeah, relating to other people. He still, you know, he also th still thinks that you know, SD6 is Black Ops CIA and he starts out not field trained. Some find him annoying, not unlike Neelix from Star Trek Voyager. I can understand why, but personally I love both characters. They find new situations and subjects for him to be awkward about. He crosses people's boundaries, he admits things that maybe shouldn't be, and yeah, brings up subjects that are yeah, awkward. He's he's super nice. He's you know, he is the, the nicest, sweetest guy, but yeah, sometimes he just He's, he's not that great around people and he you know he deeply cares about Jennifer Sydney rather he'd like Jennifer as well and when dealing with bombs when when he is you know on comms with someone talking about bombs he has a bad habit of saying should rather than will you know this this should work rather than that will definitely yeah he is comic relief and thus less developed than the main characters eric weiss as played by greg grunberg because this is jj 
is Vaughn's partner and he's much more extroverted and fun and he kind of pokes at Vaughn. He is a great friend to him and they, you know, very, very personal friend of his and they talk relationships. He, you know, he knows him very well, no, has known him for a long time. Julian Sark, as played by David Anders, is a dangerous, skillful field operative. I won't give away who he works for, and he has an awesome English accent. That brings us to Will Tippin, played by Bradley Cooper, little known person. You, you may have heard of him. You know, he was he was in that one kind of really, you know, no nobody really heard about, but yeah. Actually, the, my, my ex-fiancé and I, you know, actually, yeah, my, my ex-fiancé pointed out a while ago that who would have thought that the most famous people to come out of the shows we watched together would be Will Tippin from Alias and Bright from Everwood. The, yeah, he is a reporter for the local paper, although it's not clear exactly what, you know, what exactly he writes. He writes a lot of very different stories, so yeah. And I should mention Weiss is also, you know, a, a comic relief character, less developed than the main characters. Will is a friend of Sid and also of her late fiance and he tries to find out the truth about what happened which is of course very dangerous Francie Calfo as played by Marin Dungay is friends with Will and close friend of Sydney they are also roommates and fellow grad students and they, the two of them talk relationships. And like Will, she adds contrast. And this, you know, this normal home life versus this crazy spy world. Unfortunately, that is about what it adds. It, the, the, you know, crazy spy world and then just completely normal, you know, college girl, you know, normal life. It's just this, this high concept kind of thing. And they never really think of anything really compelling, dramatic to do with the home life, probably because they wanted to keep it very comfortable and, and yeah, but, you know, normal doesn't have to substitute boring and doesn't have to mean boring. And really, it's only when the, the two really, you know, all of the interesting dramatic stuff on on the show comes from the spy world some of it is when the normal life blends into the spy world but is always linked to the spy world this has something of a actually before that the the acting is phenomenal for all you know the the main characters absolutely the main cast absolutely embody their characters and they're very layered and complex with you know countless different emotional situations and guest character guest stars as well and you know they even either have parts written for them or they just live up to what is written for them and they got some really big film and tv stars they almost all get physical in one way or another they you know they fight they're maybe involved in a chase scene maybe they're tortured you know they they may play a really pivotal role have to deliver a lot of exposition you know incredibly important on a mission or you know yeah very developed characters the the show has very much this comic book like style 
and you know we have gadgets that clearly could not exist in the real world such as tiny scanning you know gadget hidden in super swank sunglasses you know the the old chestnut of touching your ear meaning that you know you have perfect two-way communication where you know hardly anyone else you know ever hears you know when when they talk it's almost always that only the other person can hear them the the style does sometimes get very over the top it you know the the show does tend to go for realism but it you know not to it it does set aside realism when they can do some really cool stuff and that's when it gets over the top you know the one of the on the one of the commentary tracks they point out you know why fire one shot when you can fire dozens of shots and yeah you know do you do you sneak past someone or do you run past them slide through the the coded door right as it's closing you know there are some really sudden tonal shifts especially early on with you know suddenly going from action you know between action emotion and just yeah this this home life and the crazy spy world and such Michael Giacchino does the original score, both the cool dance score and this, you know, fantastic orchestral stuff. And there's also some licensed music. And, you know, I tend to find that it really accentuates, fits and accentuates the scenes. But, you know, some say that it kind of, it tells us what to feel, spelling out the emotions. And, yeah, some will consider that to be the case. The effects are astounding and seamless. All interiors are on the Disney lot, and most exteriors, no matter where in the world they're, you know, it's doubling. Yeah, it's also, you know, the outside of the Disney lot. Production values are incredible, and every episode feels like a movie. We're, you know, I'm not the first, me and my ex fiance are not the first to note that, but it's very much true. They really convince you of the scope and hide any limitations of budget and scheduling. The pacing is intense, you know, tense, and there's a lot of suspense. There are always at least a few plot threads going on. They make some references to 9-11, some positive, some negative. The show never does 9-11 porn. And, you know, it does care on, on torture, it tends to be the bad guys. The the vast majority of torture is done by the bad guys. But unfortunately it is characterized, you know, sometimes it's a necessary evil and it's characterized as something that works when they they yeah, you you probably already know, but the the I believe Khalid Sheikh Mohammed tortured what was it 180 sometimes and it never provided any actionable intelligence. So, yeah. And the show is, of course, in favor of, you know, spying as far, you know, espionage, as far as, you know, the a country doing espionage rather than, you know, that. Yeah. And the... It does tend to characterize therapists and therapy as something just annoying, but you know sometimes they're right, and it's something you just have to go through. The show will occasionally get political, sometimes on the extremes and on you know, depending on which time it gets political, it'll be on either side of the aisle, so there's that. And it does sometimes do this kind of eh, anti-higher education kind of thing where, you know, with, with the old eh, 
thing of you could just, you know, you could get the same education with just, you know, a few bucks in late fees from the library when it's not just about the material you're studying, it's about the connections, it's about all the the different elements that you're exposed to, the, you know, so many different worlds coming together there that, yeah. The 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 themes include family prophecy trust betrayal and clandestine operations every season has at least one new major character and or new interesting distinct change to the dynamic of the show such as the power dynamic at the CIA the There are some drastic changes over the course of seasons, and while it does maintain an overall high quality, yeah, not all seasons are created equal. And season five certainly could be better. The you know the the changes in some seasons had you know the the show evolves over the course of the run and. Yeah, you know, some changes are for better, some are for worse, and some are ridiculous, and there, you know, some viewers gave up along the way, you know. Mostly it did lead to interesting new situations and stories that couldn't have been told before, but, you know, whether you like it or not is subjective, and some will stop watching, you know, season two, three, four. You know, season four went for very, you know, very much one-off episodes where the the bad guy is introduced and defeated in that one episode, which, again, gave us some really interesting stories. And that is dropped in the fifth season, which has some problems of its own and is just overall not not that memorable compared to earlier seasons. You know, they they seem to reuse even some CGI and score, and certainly the CGI is lesser, and story and writing is just not as good. I do recommend you watch the entire show, and while not everyone will like the ending, it does have an ending. And, you know, overall it is five good years, even if not everything was wrapped up. The action is one of the real high points of the show, with chases on foot and the rare, you know, action scene involving a car, which are all awesome and well worth the wait. There is not a single car scene in the show that is not memorable and really badass. The fights tend to be melee, and there's a lot of improvisation of weapons, you know, just using items on hand. If a, you know, if there are like, if there's like a broom nearby, they'll grab that and fight with. Or just heavy items nearby. Or just, yeah, ones to grant you slightly more reach. Or, yeah. And you know the the fights feel real not rehearsed and you can practically feel the impact of the, the yeah the the hits i should also mention the the ending we don't get answers to absolutely everything but this was back when jj actually did provide answers there are far less unanswered questions in this than for example lost and the you know in, in the fights, no one can completely avoid taking hits, nor can anyone take too many hits without falling. There are some shootouts, including some very nice dual wielding, yeah, and every type of gun that can be used by, you know, a person, you know, if, if, if it's not atta attached to a vehicle, it will appear in this show. And they, you know, they tend to make for some really cool scenes with them as well.
the they don't always carry pistols and such you know in some operations they just wouldn't be able to hide them maybe they have to get you know searched physically maybe they go through a metal detector and yeah sometimes they just aren't in a situation where they where they should shoot anybody much less the target maybe they want him alive maybe yeah and they will use live rounds when it's you know clearly bad guys and tranquilizer you know ammunition for when it's you know people who maybe don't know that they're working for bad guys or even you know hypothetically maybe at some point they'll have to do a mission where they'll be you know in a US government facility or otherwise dealing with friendlies and just still have to shoot and hence tranks. There are some very short and also really tense and intense action scenes. The The show gets violent and brutal and really pushes the boundaries for that, which is also where some of the tonal whiplash comes in. And JJ is quite the sick puppy with some really twisted material, especially in torture and interrogation situations. I would definitely say this is easily the best JJ ever did. Lost could be great, even better than this, but it also got really bad. It was severely uneven of a show. And yeah, I mean, even, I mean, there are a couple of season one episodes that are bad. And season two, I mean, the season two concept alone is just such a letdown from all the buildup for it in season one, which there, there's never a letdown of that magnitude in this show, which still has quite a bit of buildup. And the, you know, this was also before JJ went completely nuts with his trademark, so it doesn't have too much. There's not too many lens flares, not too much of the nonlinear, you know, they, they will have a, you know, a scene starting with something dramatic with you not really knowing the, the what, the where, the who, and, you know, it really drop you in the middle, and then you have to pick up from scenes that come later in the episode and figure out and follow what's going on. You know, this is very much a J.J. trope, and it works in the pilot of this, the pilot of Lost, and some Lost in general, but not always. It is very much a gimmick of his, and yeah, here it just is not overused. And, you know, it's probably, my expansive point out, it's probably to hook the viewer so that, you know, instead of expecting us to follow the entire story, if they just start where, you know, start at the beginning of the story, and then, you know, then we get, like, you know, home life stuff in this, you know, lost flashbacks and lost the number 47 is used quite a lot, and it's it's mentioned early on that it's a prime number, and I think there is a reason why it's it's used a lot. And yeah, this was before Damon Lindelof, who joined him on Lost, who made JJ far far worse, which is something that I realized from I I haven't watched much of anything from JJ in a while not particularly anything he's made since, you know, I don't remember which came out first, if it's Mission Impossible 3 or, you know, Cloverfield, but, excuse me, but I have watched some of what Damon Lindelof has written and also just read about, you know, read and watched reviews of stuff that he scripted where yeah, you know, that people describe these ridiculous twists and such, and yeah, I'd, I'd say, you know, it's especially Lindelof, but, you know, JJ took some of that with him to some of, yeah, again, some of that I know from reviews of them, but yeah, you know, JJ, as far as I've seen, just does not do the non-linear anywhere near as well as 
Tarantino does, where he'll really build an atmosphere and make you care about a normal situation before taking it to something unexpected. You know, rewatch Reservoir Dogs, rewatch Pulp Fiction. I'm I'm saying rewatch because if I have to tell you to watch them, yeah, you know, and and clearly this does owe a debt to Tarantino with a lot of ideas and they do also make references and yeah. let's just say that Tarantino expressed how he what he felt about the show and it was very positive I've read other parts of this franchise the links are in the description box Please comment, thumbs up, and subscribe for more content.